Look at things like the, the impact of inequality. So um, there's a fantastic book called The Spirit Level by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, which I'd recommend anyone reads, which tells you about just how damaging inequality is. So it does things like driving up uh, murder rates, assault rates. It, it, it increases early deaths from things like heart attacks and, and other uh, chronic health conditions. If we can move away from that inequality, we can live in a better society. And that's the prize here. So the prize is let's, let's deal with inequality. Let's give everybody a basic level of income and a basic level of dignity that's universal, that, that, that doesn't require them uh, to jump through hoops, to turn up to appointments, to, to do things that, um, that, that, that aren't, they aren't necessarily able to do. And then you get the prize of a society that is healthier and happier. And if you can do that through taxing, and I, I, I would argue that you should tax assets, but you should also tax extraction. So where we have extractive industries, then I think that's, that's a really good place to, to, to go and raise taxes because those, those are things that are a one-off. You, uh, you can't dig things out of the ground more than once and use them. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a really good place to, to get these, these resources as well. And of course, in the UK, we've seen over the past 50 years how we've largely wasted the resources we got from North Sea oil and gas. That's an interesting uh, point that you're making. But to go back on the, the opening statement uh, about taxing wealth, and especially unearned one, it's highly politically loaded, right? When on the back of that you're pushing basic income, do you actually shoot yourself in the foot by putting it into one specific political camp more so than another? And then I'll, I'll go to you, Almas, because that must be completely unpalatable in the US at the moment. Yeah, it's, it is, I think, un, unpalatable at the U.S. at the moment, but we have to remember that there was a time when income taxes were completely unpalatable um, in the United States and were the subject of you know, quite very, very strong disagreements between um, different parties, and we eventually got an income tax in the United States moving away from tariffs uh, because we had increasing income, particularly in the northeastern part of the country, from industrial wealth. Um, so that's... Which you know, taxation needs to go to where the money is, um, and so when money is, uh, uh, you know, when the wealth of society is mostly in its land, you'll have um, you know contrib contributions from people who own land and estates funding the government. When you move to an industrial economy, you'll have um, income from wealth, uh, uh, sorry, taxes from uh, from income funding uh, the government. And when you move to uh, a post-industrial economy like we have with a tremendous amounts of um, income inequality and, and, and lots of wealth accumulation on the parts of uh, you know, the top 5 or 10% of society, then that's where you go um, for the money that you need to fund your government. So I think that one of the, the problems in the basic income conversation is that we often start with, well, how are we going to pay for it? There's not enough money, so we can't do it. I think instead we should think about what's the kind of society that we want and then think about how we pay for it. Uh, that's what we would do, you know, as a family. Uh, you think about what kind of life you want, what kind of home, uh, you know, what kind of job, and then you, you set out to try to make those things happen. So I think we should we should start with the the vision of the society that we want, and I very much agree with the one that that Peter described. And I think we're we're already there. You know, a lot of the conversation in the United States is about the robots are coming to you know take away all of the manufacturing jobs and the uh, low skilled service jobs and even some of the higher skilled service jobs. We don't have to wait for that future um, to come. We already have that, that future now. That we have seen in the United States that um, increases in economic growth overall have not been shared with all workers equally. They've gone disproportionately to the top um, income and wealth holders. So it's, it's not, you know, we're not taxing wealth or high incomes because we hate the rich um, or we're, we're jealous of them or envious of them. That's just where the money is. Yeah, and let's stick to that idea of uh, getting the society we want, because it's also uh, very important to recognize that the narrative of basic income uh, is hitting a psychological wall, which is, you know, it's been extremely entrenched over the past 200 years. Industrial revolution created an industrial model of education. Uh, the whole narrative is about go to school, get a job, contribute something, and your worth will be... Uh, measured against not necessarily the amount of money you have, but the, how meaningful your job is for the society. So does the idea stand a chance if we don't challenge those fundamental principles as well, Peter? 
Uh, that's a, I mean, that, that's a, that's a really good, a good point, and and I think um, I just wanted to pick up on one one thing from the last uh, the last section, which was in 1945 we decided in the UK that we wanted a free national health service, and it's the most cherished institution in the country. If you do a poll and you ask people what they like, the NHS finishes top in almost every poll. Uh, at that time, Britain was absolutely saddled with war debt, it, uh, it had a smashed society, and yet it was able to do what people really wanted to do, which was to create a national health service. Uh, and, and, and that shows that you can do what you want to do when you need to do it if you've got the will. And, and that's, that then becomes possible. You know, everything in history is impossible until it happens. And once it's happened, it becomes inevitable. Um, and that, that's a really important thing, thing to, to hang on to. And to go back on the, uh, the fundamentals of what we get taught, what we get raised with in terms of narrative, is there a way for uh, basic income and the idea to integrate that? Because can it actually be bolted on the system as we know it without challenging the, those preconceptions? Does it, does it stand a chance if we don't go to the philosophical debate? And how do we go to the philosophical debate without shutting everybody off and actually making it engaging? So I, I think that I, I think that those those are those are really important points, and I think there's there's a thing here about what it is that we love doing. What is it that humans love doing? Uh, and a lot of critic critics of of universal basic income say people will be lazy. They'll be. Um, I, I did a did a media interview once where uh, a tabloid journalist described it as a layabouts charter. Uh, a quite colourful way of, de of describing what many people's fears are here. But actually, when you look at what people do, what they, what they do in, in their own time is things that are creative. So they do craft, they, do, they create things, they, they, they make uh, normally uh, beautiful items, or they, they spend their time learning music or learning, um, learning foreign languages or learning how to do something that, that, that they, can't, they can't do or, or consuming art and, and, and other things. And those are the things that actually make us more human. They relate very much to what our humanity is. And what we've been forced into doing is productivist jobs that are about um, creating things to be consumed when that consumption is not necessarily what it is that makes us human. And, and I think that's this is one of the ways that we can throw off those shackles. And I think we live in a world that's absolutely full of alienation, where, where everybody feels incredibly alienated. They hate their jobs, they hate, they hate work, they hate uh, the system that, that they're working in. That's why, we, that's why we have people voting for things like, like Brexit for, for, for Donald Trump. We need to find a way to get away from that. And I think a universal basic income isn't all of that, but that's one of the key planks to this. It's one of the ways in which we can really get people to focus on what it is that makes them happy and that makes those around them happy. And when we have happy people, we have a better world. So could we simplify to the extreme and say, we're coming to the certain end of the industrial society. Of course, it still has a lot of uh, a profit to extract and it still can go quite a long way. But we could say, you know, most of it has been built. What we need, we have in terms of material comfort. Is, isn't it time now to let the, uh, the machines take over the boring and degrading work and move to a society which is more about innovation, creativity, and basically trying to do good rather than do less bad? So there's, a, there's an analogy with the material world here as well. Is, is that something that would be palatable, you think, Almaz? I do, and I think that um, it's instructive to think about the different kinds of values that um, underpin different sorts of societies. So if we think back to um, the feudal uh, societies um, that, uh, that we said goodbye to when we moved into industrial capitalism, they were really based on authority and loyalty. Right? You, had, you had a duty um, to your, your king, to your landlord, um, uh, to your church. And that, those, that was really sort of the fundamental value in society. And when we moved to an industrial society, we moved to one where the value of, of competition um, and uh, individual incentive uh, was really prioritized. So I think now in the service economy and the, the post-industrial economy that we find ourselves in and the creativity economy that we should be moving into, the value should really be on cooperation and collaboration. 
So we need a, an economic structure that supports that. And I think one way to move beyond some of the polarization that you find when you, when you talk about basic income uh, to non-experts is to think about the, uh, the ways in which our economy is already built on cooperation and collaboration and think about not you know, completely eliminate, eliminating competition and um, incentives to, uh, for individual gain, but to think about shifting the balance more in the direction of cooperation. So when you look at basic income from a, a gender or feminist perspective, um, you know, you see that, as Peter's been alluding to from the beginning, uh, one of the very important work in society um, is caring work, and that's not paid for at all in the, in the market. So we all already belong to families and communities and societies where uh, we have unconditional, individualized, um, in, you know, universal care that we provide to each other and that's what allows us to participate in the more competitive market economy so we still want to maintain both as we move forward into the, the new economy of the future but it's it it seems like we'll all be better off if we move